So when I was a little boy, my family and I moved uh, to the French countryside. And behind our house were these amazing fields that I'd always be cycling around. Sometimes I'd go to the local lake and I'd go and collect tadpoles so that I could have a frog pond at home. So my childhood was creative, it was really adventurous, and my home life was incredibly happy. My home life was happy, but school was a different story. I hated school. I felt trapped. I felt oppressed. I hated that I had no choice but to go. And that once I was there, I had no choice as to what I got to do. It felt like years, months, weeks, days, even hours had all been planned out for me for the next decade to come, with almost no room for me to be me. I remember in my teens, I got a school report back, and it said, Jonathan is talented, but must stop daydreaming or gazing out of the window. I then got, when I was a bit older again, I got the results back from a maths exam, and I got the exam and saw that I'd failed. But I looked in the paper, and I had every calculation correct. So I asked my teacher why, and he said, ah, Mr. Barnes, your calculations are correct, but the way you got there was all wrong. So I had to express myself creatively outside of school. For me, it was sport. Uh, and I remember one summer, I wanted some new sports gear. So I organized tournaments and events for my parents' customers. I had to sell my ideas, and then I had to count and collect the money, and then I had to organize and run the events. I also had another passion, which was technology. And I was really lucky because my parents, even on a school night, would let me stay up through the night so that I could learn to code or design websites. So it felt ironic that school just felt like such hard work. But it was actually at home that I worked the hardest and that I learned the most. Years went on and I did all the right things. I went to university, I got a few decent jobs. But in my mid-twenties, I got really sick and suffered from a really bad bout of depression. So my mental health was at an all-time low. And that was a life-changing experience for me. I had to learn about who I was again. I went on a long walking holiday with a friend. I taught myself to meditate. And gradually, I was back. After a while, the kid who daydreamed and gazed out of the windows was back. And it was at that moment, as I felt good, that I fell in love. In fact, it was as I felt good that I fell in love twice. My amazing, wise girlfriend had an amazing, wise little boy who was six at the time. And as our relationship blossomed, so did our family. So after a year, we decided it was time for an adventure. So my girlfriend quit her job and I guess our little boy quit his school. We bought three backpacks and went to Nicaragua for a month and then Costa Rica for almost six, where the nature is beautiful and hidden in the jungle is a beautiful little school. It's called Casa Sula, a democratic school. There are no teachers, no curriculum, no classrooms, no <laughs> grades. I remember going there on one of the first days with our son, and the guide welcomes us. And she comes up so full of love and says, welcome to Casa Sula. You're gonna have a wonderful time here. Now put your bag in a locker, and then you can do what you want. So we go to the lockers, he looks at all of them empty, and says, John, which locker should I choose? I said, I don't know, what do you think? And he says, John, please tell me. Then he notices, in the other room, there are some children wearing shoes, some are wearing flip-flops, and some aren't wearing shoes at all. And he says, John, what should I wear? 
I don't know, what do you think? John, please tell me. Then we're going to take part in a maths game that they were playing. Some of the kids had the paper portrait, and some had it landscape. John, how should I hold the paper? I don't know. What do you think? John, please just tell me. But then I learned perhaps my most important lesson from the trip. And it was that in directive schools, there are thousands and thousands of moments where we steal autonomy from a child. We tell them what to wear, tell them where to sit, when to speak, even when to pee. And every time we do that, we steal an opportunity for them to learn how to learn. An opportunity to, to be free thinkers. Or an opportunity fundamentally to become emotionally resilient. So after a few, way, a few weeks, we noticed a huge change. He started coming home, and we would see that he would go to the fridge and make his own snacks. We saw that he started suggesting all these activities for us to do. He started asking us what we had been doing with our day. But the main thing we noticed was that he started walking differently. His shoulders were back. He looked adults in the eyes. And we realized that he felt good in his skin. I learned so much from this school. On uh, Monday mornings, they have what I call kids' council, where a facilitator will get the children in a circle and get them to talk about the things they wanted to improve about the school, and then to take responsibility over, over who was going to implement those improvements. They would learn about democracy by voting people into positions for the next week, who's organizing lunch, or the river walk, or the maths games. I saw two children have a real argument one day, and the guide, instead of separating them, came up and put a hand on each shoulder and gradually helped them to enter a dialogue where I guess they learned a small lesson about conflict resolution. I met a number of children who taught themselves how to read and write. I really always thought you needed to teach someone how to read or write, but it turns out in the correct, creative, comfortable, loving environment, around the age of nine and 10, children start to teach themselves how to read or write. And in fact, they do it in a few weeks. It doesn't take years that it does when you force feed letters to a little child. I had this great story where this one day he came back from school and my girlfriend asked him what he'd done with the day. And he said, oh, today I just lay down in the hammock and chatted to my friend all day. And then she said to me wisely later on, like, that was an amazing moment that he was able, without any social pressure, to learn to socialize in his own way, at his own pace. And I giggled in my head and I thought of the hundreds of pounds I could have saved in therapy if I had been to a school like that too. When we left, we asked him what was different about this school. And he said, well, at a normal school, they tell me what's right and what's wrong. But at this school, I had to think for myself what I think is right and what I think is wrong. He had to think for himself. Part of my job is to think about alternatives to the bigger institutions of the world, the future of democracy, the future of work. And when it comes to education, I just want to share three basic patterns that I see. The first is complexity, and that's that we live in a world that is more complex than ever we hear, and the reason is because the problems of the world are global in nature today. They're global because everything is so interconnected because of the speed of technological progress. And that complexity requires ingenious new solutions for the world of tomorrow. And those solutions come from creativity, which luckily is one of a child's greatest gifts. Now the second pattern is that because of this technological process, we're seeing a change in democracy, one of our most important institutions, and we're starting to see it erode a little bit. Now I believe it's at a tipping point where it will continue to erode, or will create better forms of democracy than ever before. But fundamentally, democracy is about cooperation. And I have now seen that it's possible to create environments where children really learn what cooperation means. And I've seen so many children who don't even share a common language play kindly with each other. Perhaps a lesson that they could teach us 
a little bit about sometimes. But the most important pattern I see is that this technological progress starts to work on one of our deepest fears, and that's the fear of the unknown, the anxiety around the unknown. Think of the number of us who will lose our jobs in the coming years because of automation. Losing the job will hurt, but the uncertainty around what to do next, that really hurts. And the best solution I've seen to this is in a 2,500-year-old piece of Eastern wisdom that asks us to live in the present moment. And when it comes to that, I believe children are our gurus. So I see the world sometimes in ironies. And education is perhaps one of the biggest ones. We want democracy, but school is the perfect simulation of autocracy. We live in uncertainty, but the school timetable is the perfect idea of artificial certainty. We need creativity, but when the bell goes, the workers go back to the factory and go through their exercises. But I've now seen there are alternatives, many alternatives. And I've also realized that I now have a new job. And that job is to guide a little boy to think for himself and to be who he wants to be. So we're currently exploring a blended model, democratic schooling and unschooling. And just over the road, in a workspace with some friends who are like-minded, we started to build a workspace that's for all ages. And it's split into three areas. And recently, in a focused area, I was writing my book as my little boy was reading a novel next to me. In the interactive area, my girlfriend was having workshops and meetings, and we saw children who were building stuff out of Lego. And in the social area, we learned to live with each other. Every week we have a meeting where we try to hear everybody's needs and improve the place based on that. It's not easy. At home, we learn about maths by calculating the dimensions for the skateboard that we're building. He now wants to sell the skateboard online, so maybe we'll learn some new skills there. By learning to solve the Rubik's Cube, we understand what an algorithm is. And in our family meeting, every week, when we discuss and negotiate screen time, we learn to compromise and to cooperate with each other. My new job is the hardest job that I've ever had. And like all parents, I didn't get the manual. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm constantly worried that I'm getting it wrong. But it's also the most inspiring job that I've ever had. In a few weeks' time, my girlfriend and I are getting married. We'll be husband and wife. And a few weeks ago, our son, I was on my own with him, and he said to me, what are you going to promise mommy at the wedding? And I said, I'll promise to support her in following her dreams. And then he went a bit like, <laughs> and said, will you promise that to me too? I said, I will. I think the, the problems that we face in the 21st century are complex. But the skills that we need to overcome them are innate in children. And there are many different ways and many different things we can do to improve the education system. But one thing we can all do as educators is to bring up a generation of free-range chickens, not caged hens. The best thing we can do is to set children free. I believe the best thing we can do is to learn to get out of the way to not interrupt, and to just be with children. And if we do that, I hope that in the future we'll look up to a generation younger than us and be proud that they were daydreamers and that they gazed out the window. <laughs>